Hey everybody, <laughs> welcome to you. Happy Valentine's Day. This is Tony Robbins. Hi everybody, we're here in Palm Desert. Welcome, we're excited. It's our We Love Love. It's excited to be with you here once again this year. And this is our anniversary. This is, it is. Uh, anniversary. One on our 17th. Mwah, thank you. <laughs> uh, one on our 17th year together, which we're pretty thrilled about. So we've seen you send a bunch of questions in. They're coming in pretty rapidly. And we got, I think, about a little bit less than an hour here together. So let's jump into it. Our assistant here is going to throw them to us so we can be spontaneous instead of reading them. So, uh, Mary, why don't you give us one or two? Okay, perfect. How about the first one is from Jessica on Instagram, who just wants to know your da daily practices that have kept you together over the last 16 years. Well, intimacy is a great daily practice. <laughs> no, I think um, I think the most important thing is to not make your partner responsible for your happiness. Mm. Um, I think uh, most people go to a relationship where they think a relationship is a place to go to get something, and that never lasts. If your relationship is a place you go to give something, then what happens is in the beginning of a relationship, most people want to, their whole life is about what can I do for my partner? How can I light them up? And as the years go by, what most people start doing is measuring what am I getting versus what am I giving? And as soon as you start measuring, it's a transaction, it's no longer love. And so um, I think for us, neither one of us is trying to make the other person make us happy. Our, we're really just trying to light the other person up and, and fortunately we're all successful in each other. Uh, and that's made our life incredibly blissful. What would you say, Annie? And I also think, you know, you create, we anyways, we steal moments. Our life is incredibly busy. Mm -hmm. We can work a 20 hour day and not even blink an eye. And yet we carve out, whether it's a minute, whether it's moment, whether it's date night, whether it's timing. I mean, we really uh, celebrate our love and we do that by expressing it. We do it. Everybody feels love in different ways. And I know what lights him up. He knows what lights me up. Uh, but first and foremost, bringing ourselves to the table, bringing ourselves in a beautiful state of being and knowing that uh, ultimately I'm responsible for my happiness. And other than my love, my joy and my beautiful state is the greatest gift that I can give this man. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> um, but I think, it, I think it also comes down to, if you're watching right now, and it's you want your relationship to go to the next level, it's mm -hmm. you got to take a look at where you are. I always tell people, you got to know where you are, know where you want to go, and then you can get a map how to get there. And most people are not honest about where they are. And I always tell people there's six positions. So anybody who's watching right now, ask yourself what position you're in. Position one, the ideal position is you have love and passion. You are driven crazy by this person in the most beautiful way. You know, you think about them constantly. You want to be with them constantly. You want to make love to them. You're, you're hungry for them all the time. So that position is ideal. And when you're in position one, you always want more. So it's like, how do I enhance that? How do I deepen it? How do I enrich it? Position two is you really love each other but there's not enough passion. And that's where we hear probably 85, 90% of the couples we talk to, maybe 95 really, they love each other, but what's happened? We don't have, we have this spark in the beginning, but not so much. That's position two. And the problem with position two is uh, once you start to get where there isn't as much passion, so maybe explain later if we get a good question about it, when you don't have the same level of feeling of attraction, little things bug you. Hmm. You know, in the beginning of a relationship, the person can do anything you think it's adorable, right? Mm -hmm. And then as time goes by, sometimes you get an irritated state that have nothing to do with your partner, and it gets linked to one another, and things start to break down. So it's not just about intimacy, although one of the things that we want people to understand is the only difference between an intimate relationship and a friendship is intimacy. Mm -hmm. So you got to have passion and love. If you're at position number two, I often ask a room, I'll say, what does it feel like when you have passion and all the love you can imagine? Total passion, total love, and the room will make this incredible sound. I'll say, okay, position two is you love each other but not enough passion. And position two is you barely hear people. It's this huge drop. Position three real fast is you're in a relationship and there's not much love. There's not much passion. There's, you know, basically friendship here. You're in a relationship really of convenience. Um, you're, you're, you're not getting much out of the relationship. You have separate lives. You have same kids, same family. And you've seen so many couples like that. Position four is uh, you're in a relationship and you're planning your escape. <laughs> and often we'll talk about, you know, someone will say, you know, when the kids get out of high school, I'm out of here. That's their plan. But the problem is the kids are five, mm -hmm. you know. And you're so, pretty much just roommates, truthfully. Very truthfully. Out of necessity. And, and, and you know, like you don't want to go to bed. You're hoping the other person's already asleep. It's the worst feeling in the world, some people there. And real fast, position number five is you're not in a relationship, but you want to be in one. That's a hungry, beautiful position if you're single. And then position six, you're not in a relationship, but you don't want to be in one. I don't want a relationship. So where are you? 
what position are you in? And whatever position you're in, you got to move up or you're going to move down. Even in position one, it's got to grow or it starts to die. So maybe we can take some of the questions, but I think it's important for you to decide where am I? Mm -hmm. What position am I committed to? Mm -hmm. And then let's figure out a plan to get you there. Let's go with another question. Perfect. How about a question about growth? This is from Kristen in Facebook. She says, how do you two continue to grow as a couple um, without growing apart? How do you find ways to stay connected, especially with different interests? You're both extremely ambitious people. What keeps you together when you continue to grow individually? Huh. That's number one. We put each other number one. Uh, That's the most we, important. Absolutely. We share, of course, there's different interests, but we share our values are completely aligned. And no matter what in our life, this is our home base. This is where we come to fill up. Uh, you know, we always start here and then go out to the world, if that makes sense. And from that place, growth is easy when you're conscious. Uh, I think taking 100% responsibility, I can fall asleep, I can be blind, I can, you know, miss in a moment and be unconscious. But <laughs> everybody can, I do. Uh, but I'm personally committed in this space of our love of waking up every day and making it new and bringing more of me to the table. And I think if that's your standard, sometimes in a relationship it's so easy to look at what you're not getting and looking at your partner and saying, gosh, he or she isn't doing that for me, rather than really starting here individually with yourself uh, and knowing, gosh, like where, you know, what am I missing or what am I, what have I fallen asleep at? And from that place, growth makes it so beautiful and it just makes it all possible and every day feels new. I would say, uh, I'd echo everything my girl said, but I'd also add that you have to put the stake in the ground and mm -hmm. decide that your relationship's the most important thing in your life. Mm -hmm. And I think more women do that than men, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, if you would have said to me that my relationship with my wife would be more important than my mission, no matter how much I love my wife prior to being married to my wife, I'd say you're crazy. Uh, for a man, very often, a masculine man anyway, you're out there doing something in the world and then this is the reward you get for, for working so hard. And um, what I found is by making my relationship first with my girl, the love, the joy, the passion, the aliveness, then gives me 10 times more power for the mission outside the world. So we put each other first before the business, uh, before problems, before kids. As much as we love our children, as much as we love everything, they know that we're number one for each other. And that's given them a role model to be able to have healthy relationships. We've changed our culture in the last 20 years where we put kids first. And what happens is they see their parents have a horrible relationship and there's no way they have any form of anchor to believe that they'll have a passionate and alive, loving relationship in the future. They have no role model. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's really critical. But I think it also brings up the most important point, which is whenever we talk to people in relationship, we tell people the most important rule of relationship is it's all you. <laughs> we always want to point to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you a perfect example at a, at a simple level. If you think about, if you know our work, we talk about how our mental and emotional state affects everything. If, if you're the fastest runner in the world and I put you in mud, you're not going to run very fast. And the, the, whether you have mud or hard surface is the emotional state you live in. So if you're naturally pissed off all the time, frustrated, you've conditioned yourself to be that way, your partner's not going to keep you happy very long because you're going to go to those places that you've trained yourself to go to eventually and emotionally. <laughs> sorry, I was just. <laughs> Hi guys, sorry, I was just. <laughs> my crazy sorry. wife. <laughs> like, oh my I mean, goodness! We've been okay, doing a well, seminar. My wife's thought... sitting beside me, waving at me. Oh. Hi, how are you? What you doing? I'm red in the cheeks. Well, that's all right. Anyway, sorry about that. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> well, I love Playfulness. That's another. That's a very important one. <laughs> Playfulness and patience are very important elements. You probably Putting need your relationship ahead you. of your mission, very important. <laughs> you know. That was funny. But what, oh. I, what I want you to get is <clears throat> you, the, the thing that's going to determine the quality of your relationship is the state you bring to it every day, mm -hmm. the mental emotional state. So if you let the environment be what determines how you are in your relationship, you're going to have a crappy relationship because the environment is not always going to be beautiful. In fact, most of us have challenging environments we're in. The more people you care about, the more employees you have, the more companies you have, the more chances something's mess up. So here's what we call the core of relationship. We call it the state of the union. Mm -hmm. The state of the union, your state, will determine the state of your union. And don't get me wrong. If you have the wrong person and you don't share values and you really aren't about each other and one is truly selfish, you're not making them selfish, it's not going to last. Mm -hmm. But if there's common values, then that aliveness comes by you constantly putting yourself in the same state that attracted each other into, which is this playful, joyous, passionate, 
hungry, fun, funny, spiritual, whatever it was about you that was really you, was authentically you. But people drop that. It's like they share that in the beginning and then they take for granted. They'll say things to the partner they wouldn't say to a stranger. So think of it this way. If two people are in a really phenomenal emotional state, they're just happy out life, they're enjoying themselves, they have a sense of meaning in what they do, and they're both up here in these peak states and they're around each other, you could tell me what kind of relationship are they going to have. Two people in a great state are going to have a great relationship. If you get two people in a okay state, good state, the best of relationships can be okay. If you get two people who are frustrated with their life and pissed off, it's only a matter of time before they're going to piss each other off and tear each other down. Or one's high and one's low. So what we've learned to show us is I've got to bring the state to my girl. And I can bring her out of the state she's in if I do it. She sure as heck can do that with me. But you've got to own that you are responsible for your relationship because blame will never solve it. And I want you, if you would, let's talk about the difference of the two kinds of states you can live in, because this might, if we did nothing else, be the best thing we could give anybody. Probably one of the most transformative, not probably is, one of the most transformative experiences that we've had in our life, uh, you know, what Tom talked about earlier about bringing, you know, your state to the table, is just realizing that I personally am ultimately responsible for how I show up every single day. And, you know, people just earlier, just even with this question, like having that newness and that growth in our relationship, we choose that every day consciously. You know, we choose a beautiful state of being. If I'm not, if I'm stressed, if I'm, you know, sad, if I'm upset, if I'm frustrated, whatever the external, uh, you know, stimulus might be internally, I'm responsible to navigate that because it affects right here. It affects your relationship. And it's so crazy because, you know, when you're talking about friends, everybody has somebody, if you ask yourself, where you show up at your optimal, either a dear, dear friend, uh, maybe to your grandmother, dad, yeah. your, your parents were, you know, just you bring all of yourself and you're conscious of the beautiful state of being that you deliver. And if you can make that commitment here in this place of relationship, a beautiful thing happens, a beautiful thing, even more beautiful. The love that we have in our love for 16 years has been the most extraordinary love. But the last year of that actual recognition in our life and applying it, realizing that ultimately I am 100% responsible for how I show up in my state of being. Not even just how I show up, but mm -hmm. your experience of life. Absolutely. Um, we can't control the events of our lives. Mm -hmm. We could influence them, but we can control what it means to us. We can control what we feel. Mm -hmm. We can control the, the experience of it. And a dear friend of ours, you know, I've taught for years, we've taught for years that, listen, you've got to bring everything to the table. Blame never makes anything better. Blaming somebody else doesn't make it better. And also beating yourself up, blaming yourself doesn't make it better. Horrible. And if you'd asked us a year ago, do you guys have a magnificent life? It's, are you kidding? It's the most extraordinary life you can imagine. I'm totally in love with my wife. We have four incredible kids. We have this mission. We travel the world. You know, it's the most beautiful life you could imagine. I have a magnificent life. And if you would have said, do you guys ever suffer? It's a suffer. We both say, hell no, we don't suffer. Um, but I'm, uh, one of my friends from India, we were visiting with about less than a year ago. And we're having a conversation, and he said, what's your spiritual vision? And I said, well, to change the world, to help people with this whole thing. He goes, what if your spiritual vision was just to live in a beautiful state? Mm -hmm. I said, we already do that. Mm -hmm. And he said, I know you do. He said, but what if you took it to a different level? What if measuring it not as a life? You do what you do best, Tony. He said, you always talk about you can't make something better if you don't measure it. You can't manage something if you don't measure it. What if you really measured all emotions you experience in life were in one of two types? They were their beautiful states of being. Not just happiness, it could be joy, it could be hunger, playfulness, passion, creativity, gratitude. Those are all beautiful states. When you're in those beautiful states, your brain, your body knows what to do. Mm. And all painful states were called suffering states. We might not call them suffering. As achievers, we don't suffer. You know, we don't even have fear. We just have stress, right? Mm. Stress is the achieving word for fear. But there's all kinds of suffering states. Frustration, overwhelm, worry, sadness, loneliness. Anger, Fear. frustration, all these things. And if you had asked me before, do you feel as emotional? I go, sure, they're part of the journey. But what he proposed to us is he said, what if they weren't? What if you decided you're going to live in a beautiful state moment to moment? And when these feelings came up, which are part of being human, you had a 90-second rule and you killed it. You killed the frustration. You killed the fear. You killed the worry because you just decided life is too short mm. to be pissed off or to be sad or be worried because there's always something you could worry about or feel sad about or be concerned about or have anxiety about. And he said, you know, what if you did it at the level, Tony, a different level? What if your spiritual vision was to live in a beautiful state? Because in that state, when you're in a beautiful state, you don't have to figure out what to do in your relationship. It's natural. It's not fake. It's not phony. It's not patronizing. It's real. It's raw. It's, it's authentic. 
And that's what makes a relationship have ignition. That's what you say. How do you have sparks in your relationship? When you both are communicating what's real authentically, but where you aren't making the other person wrong. Mm -hmm. Where you know no matter what they say, no matter what they do, they may be hurting. It doesn't look like it. We've, you know, we've all heard the phrase, there's only two forms of communication, right? There's a loving form of communication and there's a cry for help. Mm -hmm. And a cry for help looks like you're an asshole. <laughs> you know? When somebody's yelling at you, it doesn't feel like a cry for help, but they're crying for help saying, please get through to me, show me you love me. And so what we've learned is, and what we've been practicing for a little less than a year, has been the biggest change in our life has been to say, from now on, I'm 100% responsible for my experience in life. Whatever your experience, no matter what you say or do, I know your intent is pure. Mm -hmm. And my job is to make sure I find a beautiful state to bring to this because that can heal anything. Mm -hmm. That'll transform any relationship. And just let me say one thing. Mm -hmm. I want you yeah, to jump so in because like, I can feel you. I'm passionate. <laughs> <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> who do you love to be around? Mm -hmm. Somebody in a beautiful state. Mm -hmm. Somebody who, when you first met this person, they probably felt really playful or fun or joyous or loving or spirit-filled or fun or something powerful. We love to be around people that are in their true beautiful states. When somebody is suffering, we might want to help them, but if they're suffering all the time, it burns out. If the person's your partner, you go, what's going on here? If we, if you would just decide today that the most important decision in your life is that day to day, you're gonna get yourself out of any suffering state and back in a beautiful state, that beautiful state will change every relationship in your life and bring you more intimacy. If you're single, People will be attracted to you because people are attracted not to somebody who's needy and looking for it or saying, why can't I find the person? They're attracted to somebody who owns themselves, who feels alive, who's, who's flowing. And what people reject is the heavy of another person they got to try and take care of. That'll kill intimacy faster than anything. I've talked too much. No, you haven't. Not even slightly. <laughs> and, and I think the recognition that suffering perpetuates more suffering. And for myself, there was times that I felt that Tony should have a different... Uh, it's crazy, a different reaction or a different experience of something. And then my tension, my suffering inside myself created more suffering inside of him and then more suffering inside of him created more suffering inside of me. Give an example. Um, okay, uh, Tony on stage, he, you know, it's almost inhuman what he does when he's on stage. And there's a level of physicality that is just, it's, it's inhuman, it's completely. You know, 50 hours in a weekend, you know, mm -hmm. 12 hours a day, 13 hours a day, nonstop, so. And as his lady, he would get off stage and I would feel fearful, I would feel worried, was definitely one of my, my flavors of choice of suffering. And I'd be worried about him. And I never knew what that felt like, the smothering part of that. Uh, when I was worrying, I will, when I worry, I go unconscious. And so it would be more like, honey, are you okay? Are you okay? And rather than just actually being present with him and loving him, which feels completely different and honestly evokes completely a different uh, response from him, the caregiving and the smothering of worry, I didn't realize what that felt like. I actually thought it was love. And the intent is love, but the translation of that felt very different to him. And for myself, not that in a moment, we just actually had a health you know, uh, situation just the other day. Not that I don't feel fearful in a moment or not that I won't worry because I, I, I can and I do, but I don't live there and I don't stay there. And if I feel it, you'll know that you're feeling suffering if you feel tension inside yourself or you feel resistance or you feel almost just an unease. And at that moment to actually you know, go internally and do a discovery with what you're actually experiencing and recognize it and just let it go. It is as simple as that. And then from that place, to go and have a conversation completely changes the dynamic of how you'll actually relate to somebody that you love. Because when you're not suffering, there's not a charge. Mm -hmm. And so the person doesn't react. They just feel what you're really feeling authentically. And they can hear you and say, honey, I, I think I'm really going to be okay. Let me show you. On my side, you know, my wife uh, has had extreme motion sickness. Wow. <laughs> Sorry, I was just getting thirsty. <laughs> Another life moment. <laughs> This is why I'm not president of the United States, because you want to know that the first lady would be quite entertaining. <laughs> Pardon me, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just have a sip of beer. Sorry, That's okay. <laughs> so, I don't even want to say anymore what it all was. To see why I don't bring her on stage all the time with me. Holy shit. <laughs> what I was going to say is, though, this sounds ethereal, and I want to get to another question, but this uh -huh. is so important, because it affects everything. Mm -hmm. um, what will help you to understand is when you're suffering, when you're worried, when you're frustrated, when you're overwhelmed, when you're you know, scared, when you're stressed, when you're whatever. The one common denominator is you're focused on yourself. Mm -hmm. And you may not think that because you say, no, I'm worried because of my kids. I'm worried they're not doing well. Mm -hmm. But you're really worried that you failed your kids. Mm -hmm. It's about you. 
You know, I'm really, my wife would not, I was starting to say, you know, she'd get motion sickness and she'd get sick in those days. This is a great example. And I would be so upset because it's like, I shouldn't be doing this seminar. I should be putting on a plane. I shouldn't be doing, I I beat myself up. I wouldn't be mad at her. I'd be mad at me. But I'm busy beating myself up thinking I didn't do the right thing for her. This is just reality. I'm instead of dealing with reality. I'm inside myself. So she wouldn't feel my love or support. Then she would feel bad that I'm feeling bad. And and then next, you know, you're in a lousy state and then it shows up as, Maybe frustration with one another or something else, but it really starts at the basis of killing the problem while it's little. You know, the mo- to be depressed, you got to be selfish. Mm-hmm. You got to be, you say, no, I'm depressed because all this happened in life. No, all the things that happen in life that are different than you want, or you feel out of control, or you feel you're not where you want to go. Suffering always shows up with three things. Check it out. Think of a time when you felt pissed, frustrated, sad, worried. It's one of three things. You have the illusion of loss mm-hmm. because I failed to do something. Uh, I lost this love. I lost this opportunity. I lost this possibility. Because you did something to me, I'll never have something again. Three words. Loss, less, or never. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have less love, less opportunity, less success, less significance, less joy, less something because you did something or because I did something. Either way, you'll suffer. Or I'm never going to have. We'll never have what we want because this thing happened. Whenever you think a person, a place, a thing, or even yourself is going to mean you have less of something you value or you're going to lose something you value or you'll never have it, you're going to suffer. But the way out of it real fast is to breathe. Yeah. You take two minutes and you breathe. It sounds so stupid. You take yourself out of the world where you're acting. You can put your hands in your heart and breathe for two minutes. Think of some two or three things you're grateful for. That'll put you in a beautiful state. And what I do is three things. And we taught each other to do this. Find something to appreciate. All of a sudden, you know, you think your whole world's ending. And you go, you know what? We have each other. Or you know what? We have our health. Or you know what? We have our children. Or you know what? We have this beautiful mission. Or you know what? Look at this day. Right? If you can, it's hard to go straight to enjoyment when you're suffering, but you can easily go from suffering to appreciating something. And the minute you appreciate, you're out of suffering. And then I go, what can I enjoy? Because this last year I developed this just core belief that I had such a beautiful life, but if I don't find ecstasy in this moment right now with my wife, with you, <laughs> more impact people, love, accolades, you know, spirit, money, fun, sexuality. None of that's going to be any better if I can't find it in this moment. Mm-hmm. And so are my new practice is to be an overachiever in enjoyment. And when I'm finding a way to enjoy every moment, my wife feels that. She Absolutely. feels my joy. Just like what attracted me to her is this here's this ball of pure love and energy. And I want more of that, this beautiful state. So I'm bringing more of the beautiful state because I'm measuring it every day. And I'm going, okay, if I'm not, let me realize I'm not. I give myself 90 seconds, figure it out. Let me appreciate something. Let me enjoy something. Let me learn and grow from this. What can I learn? What can I grow? And then what can I love, give, or be grateful for? Because the minute you love, the minute you give, the minute you're even slightly grateful, you can't be grateful and angry simultaneously. Mm. You can't be grateful and worried simultaneously. And Fear and anger are what mess up any relationship. And and I just to echo what what Tom shared is for in our relationship as well. What that brings is just appreciating the beauty of the moment. It brings you present. And I have personally found myself, you know, I may have the same actions every day, but because I'm not so future focused of worry or future focused or fearful about what's going to happen, I just feel like life feels more beautiful in the moment. Um, I feel that I, I recognize more, I see more, um, I appreciate more, and so there's almost just more of a benevolence that is just natural and intrinsic that life offers itself internally, and that internal love just overflows, you know, it just overflows from such a different place of ease, um, from such a different place of just actually being in the moment and seeing that beauty. It's so funny because before we're doing this little thing on this camera and right now I'm seeing low battery and you know and I'm, I'm not gonna get up and do something else crazy and I would have had you know I would have been like in my mind obsessing about that but hey guys says low battery just FYI um, but it's beautiful to uh, to actually bring that clarity I just feel like we've really you know clarified that and it's only ignited our love it's only brought it's taken to another level as great as our life was it exploded but mm-hmm. I want you to know you have every right to suffer Yes. If you want, you have a right to feel upset or be frustrated. People do things that are unjust, that, that don't serve, that aren't nice. But people do the best they can with the resources they have. And if you're looking for a perfect person, you're going to be looking for the rest of your life and you're going to be alone. 
right? I mean, the reality is you have every right to suffer, but suffering is not going to give you anything good. It's not going to bring somebody closer to you. If somebody comes to try to heal you because you're suffering, they're not loving you. They're feeling sorry for you. <laughs> feeling sorry and being taken care of is different than being loved. And so I, it's just about saying, if you want to create a great relationship, the one you already have, or if you don't have one, you want to create one, you're single. And I don't care if you're heterosexual, homosexual, I don't care what type of relationship you want. Humans need a beautiful state. And if you bring it, you'll be attractive to your partner once again. If you bring it, you can ignite it in your partner once again. If you say it's about me instead of blame, and you don't blame yourself, I mean, it's, not, it's about me and I screwed up. It's just like, you know what? I'm going to change my state. I'm going to bring beauty to this right now. If you get into that habit, if you truly do it, Every other question you're going to ask us will be handled, I can promise you. You'll have the most amazing relationship. But mm -hmm. I want to hear some more questions from you, so let's do it. Great. Okay, first of all, if you guys are Tony and Sage fans and you're wondering where they're getting these questions, we're pulling from Tony's Twitter account, his Facebook account, his Inst Instagram. Beautiful. So if you have a question for Tony and Sage, put it in there. I'm pulling them right now. This one came in from Leo Lesh in Los Angeles. Hi, Leo. Hi, Leo. It came in right on, on your Facebook page. He says he was at Date with Destiny with both of you last December. Thank Beautiful. you so much. Awesome. He is in position four. He is planning his escape. <laughs> okay. He's having a tough time because he gets along so well with her. And all they, they have all the same friends. But he wants to know how he would convince himself that he's not a failure and move on to dating again. Similarly, Rob on Facebook says, I'm single. I want to get back in the dating game. How do I get over this fear of being hurt, what I want, and the, when, what I'm actually scared of? Mm. Well, one way to deal with fear is turn it on itself. Mm. Uh, you know... Fear is just part of being human. And I don't know if you ever get over fear. I think the reality is you learn to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, what you can do is turn fear on itself and say, if I let this fear control me, where am I going to be three, five, ten years from now? I'm going to be alone. I'm going to feel, if I feel bad now, can you imagine if you give up another five or ten years because of your fear? And the other thing I'd say is just don't make it such a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, it, for the gentleman who's talking about getting out of the relationship, in that situation, some people stay in a relationship where they're miserable just because they'd rather be in a relationship than the fear of being alone. Mm -hmm. And the, what I can tell you is if you'll do what you fear, the fear will disappear. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's jumping out of an airplane or crossing fire or ending a relationship or beginning a relationship or asking somebody out. If you'll just make yourself do it as simplistic as that sounds a few times, what was fearful will not be fearful anymore because, you know, our brains adjust very quickly as soon as we just confront reality. It's the the unknown is so much more scary than the real. Haven't you had something you were freaked out about <laughs> and then it never happened or it finally happened and when it did, just like, yeah, compared to my compared to my fear. That's why I always tell people the old phrase, you know, a courageous person dies once, you know, a fearful person dies a thousand times. Like, just get out there and do it. I mean, that's that simple. And I think the other thing is just do some baby steps. Do some little things that'll get you started so it doesn't have to be such a big Herculean effort and you'll get momentum. And I think it's, you know, whether you're separating or not, both Tony and I were in previous relationships, obviously. And I think, you know, it's if you guys love each other that much and you have that dear of a friendship, actually having a conversation from a beautiful state and sharing yes. your heart and sharing your truth and navigating this consciously, you know, an end doesn't have to be bitter. An end doesn't have to be painful. It actually can be the start of a new beginning for both of you. And as much as, you know, you're wanting to get started, I'm sure she is too, you know? And so you're setting yourself free and in turn setting her free as well for a new life. You know, I always tell people that life is the dance between what you fear most and what you desire most. Mm. And if you can be clear about what you want, that'll help you dance the dance a lot better than if you're focused only on what you're afraid of. If you give it too much focus, you're going to be pulled in the opposite direction. So there's no easy answer here. There's the, you know, it's the Nike piece. You just got to do it. Sorry to be simplistic, but it's true. And I'd rather tell you the truth than some BS positive thinking. Let's go for another question. Great, we've got Ori Sar in Israel writing in on your Aww. Facebook. Hi, Hi Ori. Ori in Israel wants to know, you guys travel so much. Yes. How do you keep a relationship so good while you're traveling so much? And a few people replied to his comment and said, yes, you know, travel is such a source. Work business travel is such a source of, of arguments in their relationship. Any tips? We don't really argue about that at all. No, we so. have, number one, we have the privilege to, the majority of the time, travel together. Yes. Uh, the times when we don't. I think, you know, exactly what we've been sharing, I would say probably the, if there was any stress to be transparent about our travel, it was my physicality. Um, mm -hmm. So it was the fact that, you know, I didn't travel well and, and uh, ironically, I, I get motion sickness when I travel. And so at this stage though, that really doesn't affect us. I think the freedom 
tone giving me the space truthfully if I'm not feeling well just to allow that to be and not making it anything else and then also me, myself giving myself that freedom if that makes sense mm -hmm. and then I think there's times too like you know where you land and you get there at 2 a.m. in the morning you're completely exhausted I think just having the consciousness not to just keep pushing and the next morning doing it all over again and getting up because it's so easy to fill a work day so you know you know we started out we talked about just making our moments matter even when we're exhausted and you're getting in at two in the morning, just even taking a moment and connecting at that time uh, to close the day uh, with love and kindness. We even do it on stage. I mean, the world's there and my girl mm -hmm. come up and I'll grab her and mm -hmm. it's 100% being with each other. It's like, I don't know there's another human being there. She doesn't know there's a human being there. We're not paying attention to them. We're just a million percent with each other. I think the other thing is humor. I mean, uh, you know, we laugh about stuff in the very beginning that I used to get so stressed about. And, you know, I picked a partner that was naturally crazy. <laughs> so it helped me. <laughs> so, but in the beginning, I can remember things with my girl. I would be like, I was so, be so stressed she was doing uh -huh. things. just so irritated she was doing things because it wasn't the right way to do it. You know, part of it is learning to not have so many rules. Mm. You know, when people work together, and when people travel together, we're around each other 22 hours a day, 23 hours a day, whatever it is, 24 hours a day. Um, a lot of people say, how do you guys do that? Well, we love each other. We share the same values. We share the same mission. We, we're we about something more than ourselves. We're trying to do something with our lives, and we share what that is. That, that helps immensely. But the other part is that we're playful. And the very things that in the beginning used to make me crazy, I'd get crazy, crazy. I'm going to be crazy forever. I'm going to suffer. I didn't have those words then. I'm going to suffer always. If she has to behave the way I think she should all the time, I'm going to suffer a lot. If anyone has to behave the way I want, then my world depends upon other people. So I, I finally said, you know what? This is absurd. My happiness, I'm not going to give my happiness away so easily. I'm not going to make it so easy. All you have to do is do something I don't like, and I'm not going to be happy. Life's too short not to be happy, to be fulfilled, to be playful, to be alive, to feel a sense of meaning. And so you have control of it. So, so many of the questions people ask us really show us that they're trying to get something from a relationship they really haven't worked on themselves. Now, that's not an excuse to say, okay, I'm going to work on myself for the next 20 years and then I'll be ready for a relationship. In a relationship is where you develop those skills. It's like, you know, you can go prepare for a fight all day long, but the whole game changes when somebody punches you in the face. You know, <laughs> suddenly your whole game plan changes. And an intimate relationship is sometimes feels like a punch yeah. in the face because the masculine feminine energies make up different meanings. You know, female energy. Now, there are men that are feminine in their energy and there are women that are. And masculine energy, its essence, there are men that are masculine and there are women that are primarily masculine in energy. They look at the world differently. For example, problems. Mm -hmm. Men's entire focus, if they're a masculine male or a female that's primarily masculine, is to kill a problem. Take a big problem, make it small, get rid of it as fast as possible. Women use problems as a way to connect. Mm -hmm. And men understand this. A woman starts telling a problem, the guy, oh, I can solve that, boom, boom. And that's what he, that's his whole life is about doing if he's a masculine man. And the feminine woman goes, he doesn't care, he doesn't understand, he's just trying to tell me a solution, he doesn't hear me. Because these two energies look at the world differently. So differently. So if you're going to have a great relationship, you're going to have to become a student of masculine and feminine energy and realize they're both inside you. But you're going to have to learn to interpret the world because m women think men are just hairy women that need coaching, right? And women, men think that women are just overly emotional, multitasking people that if they just get more logical, we'd have a better time. And the truth is, if you make your partner try to be like you, you lose your polarity. You lose that opposite energy that creates all the excitement. So today, when my girl does something used to make me crazy, I just, that's my girl. And I'm completely perfect, so she never has to do this in any way, shape, or form. But obviously, she has to go, that's my man, that's my boy. Right? Yes, crazy. And when you what love... What do you mean crazy? What are you talking about? I think when, you know, loving each other and the understanding, there's things... It was so funny, just the other day, Tony was there on his laptop, and he was looking at something. And I literally, I don't know why, but he was like, oh, honey, like, come here, I want to share something with you. And he was so touched and so moved and so kind of excited I actually thought he wrote me like a letter or wrote me a note or something this seems absurd I don't know why I did but I did in the moment so I get out of the computer screen and I'm like wow hon like what are you going to share with me and he's looking at possibly extending right our home in Sun Valley yes and he was you know looking at the lay of that of the lay of the land of you know new bodies of water Lake. and lakes and he looked at me and he's like you really don't care do you and I was like I love you so much but I don't and there was such a freedom in that moment to actually be true and sincere you and only worked not, on this for six months no I know but but it was a beautiful example of such differences there's things that he 
is so passionate and excited about, and I might be a touch curious about, but I, I well, it's not really important, but not even slightly, <laughs> like that moment. Um, but I think what was so beautiful and actually what made it so beautiful is that it, it wasn't personal. Like he, he didn't take it personal, he didn't take offense, nor did I, and we laughed our tails off. We were actually laughing, so we were crying. Yeah. And it was just such a beautiful moment, and in a different state, in a different filter, or you know, if one of us was suffering, he might have taken that personally, or I might have taken his response personally, but rather it just actually offered a moment to connect, and I was sincere and true in that moment, and, <laughs> and we laughed. So it's not that we have our values that are aligned, and our heart. But, but, but nobody is alive about no. everything. And if Not you want that, you're going to have a dead relationship, right? You need Maybe somebody to have something different. So what I, we, I would used to be like, I'd be crushed. I worked so hard. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be this beautiful place. You're going to love it when it's done. Now I just know. Yeah, she's not going to give a damn about it. Now, when it's done, she'll think it's really beautiful. But not all, and that's true almost everything we've done. So I, I've got enough history now to give myself hope. Right? <laughs> but again, it's the ability to laugh about the things that other people get pissed off about. It's about not taking it personal. It's about living in a beautiful yeah. state. It's about saying she doesn't have to love everything the same way I do for me to love her. Right? I, I can love this thing and, and her not loving it, it's okay. And it gives her freedom to freedom, be herself. Complete freedom. My wife, my wife has this thing. She has to be able to hate something first before she can love it. When we were going to move to Florida and we moved to Palm Beach, she was like, I know, but hate it. But I, 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 no, I, I like I the ability. It, All right, right, you want to say hate it? I wanted the ability to be able to say, "Hey, let me not like it, so I can, sh I can actually fall in love with it." Rather than you tell me everything that you love about Something it, about that me gentleman about out there it. doesn't seem way, very logical, does it? Doesn't other seem other logical to you. You got to hate something to love it. I didn't it. hate it, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did. Anyways, yeah, maybe I did. But you love it now. I do. But so, so I've learned that she just needs this ability to not dislike something first, and then she can choose to like it. Whereas, you know, my world is either it's right or it's not. It's you love it or you don't. If you don't love it, I want to do it. I've learned that there's a different approach. So you're watching this natural yes, reaction. You live. see what's really true. <laughs> live cameras. How about another, another question? Another question. Baby. Okay. This is a multi-platform question. We have AC Loud 28 on Instagram who says, first of all, for all of you who have so many questions, go to Dave with Destiny. All huh. your questions will be answered. <laughs> That's That's awesome. awesome. There's That's a lot of Dave with Destiny grads in here. For example, so for example, Ranjana in Copenhagen, Denmark on Facebook. Hi, Ranjana. Ranjana. She says she is single. She's been the last 10 years. She's been to UPW. She's been to Date with Destiny. It's been so transformational. But she's still wondering why she hasn't met the one. What inner work? What else does she need to do to help radiate and attract the right person? She's she's talking about how she's completed her relationship vision. Chelsea on Twitter also says, "I've created my relationship vision, and my current significant other doesn't match what I wrote down. Is that a bad sign? Any notes on relationship <laughs> vision?" <laughs> okay, well let, let's start with the vision for a second. Mm -hmm. Everything needs vision. What the Bible says: without a vision, people perish. Right. You need a vision for your business so you have nothing to grow. If you don't have a vision for growing your relationship and you're in a relationship, we now discovered your first problem. We all either grow or die. The relationship's growing, it's dying. You're growing or dying. So you do need a vision. Now, if your partner doesn't match your vision, uh, you have to ask another question. What kind of person would it take to attract the person I just described? If your vision is this beautiful, playful, enjoyable, sexy, happy, fun human being, and that's your vision, that's who you want in your relationship, you then got to ask yourself, okay, who do I got to be to attract that kind of person and keep that person in my life? And I guarantee it wouldn't be a pissy, frustrated, overwhelmed, stressed out individual because they're not going to attract them. So you got to work harder on yourself first so that you become the kind of person that will elicit from your partner your vision. Mm -hmm. Now, if you find out that you truly have a totally different view of life, you know, one wants to have... 22 children, the other wants no children ever. You know, one wants to travel the world constantly, the other one wants to live in, you know, Bofunk, Idaho. You are going to probably have to evaluate that, you know, you can love somebody and not be the right intimate partner forever. You have to make that your own decision. But I think really what you're really looking at is if you don't have the person you want in your life yet, you got to ask yourself two questions. First, am I clear what I want? But second, am I clear who I need to become to attract that? And am I willing to do what it takes? There's no free lunch. You know, people come to us all the time, they'll say, oh, God, you know, your wife is so lucky to have you. And I think you have no clue. I'm a handful, right? I'm so lucky to have her. People don't realize what has to go in to get what you want. So you got to do that. Then thirdly, are you putting yourself in an environment where you're going to find those people? I, I saw an article yesterday. I thought it was cute. It's uh, a, a Girl Scout was selling Girl Scout cookies, and she sold 147 boxes of Girl Scout cookies in 30 minutes. How'd she do it? 
She went outside in California. They have these places where people go and they have medical cards and they get legal marijuana. Well, they're coming and having marijuana and they're getting the munchies afterwards. They bought all the cookies. Now, this kid is smart. She put herself in the right environment. Are you fishing in the sewer for the relationship or are you going to the trout farm? Like, the kind of person you want, are you going to places where you're even likely to meet them? And then thirdly, are you really open? Because open means you're going to have to have a bunch of relationships where you're going to learn. Every relationship is a chance to learn. And we think we're supposed to get the perfect one right now. Well, sometimes you're not ready for the perfect one. If if I met this incredible creature years before, we would have loved each other. But I don't know that it would have been the right time. I had to go through some learnings and some lessons. So I would become more enough to be able to love her, take care of her, appreciate and worship her and adore her. And she probably would have been.